So uh, today, I think I might have the most boring title of any talks that I've ever had ever. So I apologize for that. I can see that many of you were sort of like, what? That doesn't even, that, it doesn't, that doesn't even mean anything. So let me try to correct that. So what I'm going to try to talk about today is how do we do functional programming without sacrificing the needs to be able to do communication and have resilient systems and programs? Is that an improvement or not? Just future reference? Not, not, not? OK. All right, so very, very unbold statement. I think today, more than any day before this day, we're writing more and more interconnected programs and systems. So every system and program tends to be intertwined with some other system or program. Just to make sure that I have something named after me, I think fundamentally programming is about encoding some sort of solution to some sort of problem for a machine to be able to execute. So if we can't solve something without the programming, there's nothing to encode for the machine. Right? So we need to think in order to solve problems. And I mean, it's a truism, right? There's nothing weird about it. I also think that at some level, reality always beats imaginary. Because even if imaginary is fantastic, we live in reality. So reality will always win over the imaginary, because there are fundamental constraints in reality. Some things we might wish weren't real. This is my office. This is the door of my office, and this is the window of my office. It's very real. I work out of a prison, right? Might not wish it was real, but reality, even if I dream myself away, reality is always there. Now, I happen to have the luxury of being able to leave the prison <laughs> whenever the day is over. Some people don't have that luxury. So reality very graciously gives us a separation in space and time, right? I'm here, you're there, right? Things are over there. Some people are on the other side of the planet. That means that we need to use communication for coordination, right? Things are separated. We need to use communication in order to coordinate between these things that are separated. And that means that we'll have sort of variable delays in that communication, right? It can take different paths. It might be interrupted. It might be... Uh, corrupted. We'll also have these sort of partial failures where things might be broken in one direction but not the other direction. So I think that my message is getting through but your acknowledgement is not. It also means that all knowledge is partial slash local slash stale. We only know what we know but we don't know what we don't know yet. Right? So we we'll always have potentially stale, old information, knowledge. It also means that since we have these things that are separated in space and time that uses communication for coordination, we have a lot of systems, right? Things that communicate to coordinate. So what is a system? Well, the definition is a set of things working together as a mechanism or an interconnecting network, a complex whole, right? System. If you look at a system, 
their purpose tends to be quite simple. You look at a watch, for instance. Purpose, show time, arguably quite simple. If you look at a modern automatic movement for a watch, highly complex, right? But the purpose is simple. Inner workings might be extremely complex. But they consist of collaborating components. As I said before, like we're separating space and time, we communicate to coordinate. So we need to have these sort of collaborating components. And what's interesting is about the nesting property of systems. If you really look at it, everything is a system within a system within a system within a system within a system. The body is a system. An organ is a system. A team of people is a system. A city is a system. A country is a system. The entire sort of humanity is a system. The planet is a part of a solar system. You see the systems within systems within systems. What's interesting is that, according to my observation at least, components tend to be as simple as feasible, but not simpler than that. And I think that sort of derives from, from sort of Darwinism. Things can just be as complex as to achieve what they're trying to achieve, but not more complex, because that costs more. <clears throat> Resilience is a very important aspect of building systems. And according to Richard Cook, and I'm just paraphrasing him here, any sufficiently complex system is always, always running in degraded mode. Because as something gets more complex, the, the risk of something being wrong somewhere within the system becomes one. It just, it's just a matter of fact. So this has a fundamental implication on how we need to be able to reason about our systems. We can't program for the happy path because that happy path will never occur in practice if the, if the system is complex enough. Does that make sense? Cool. So communication, very fluffy word, right? It's the production and consumption of some sort of message, right? And in order to message or send messages, we have to be able to reason about who is the intended recipient of this message. We need to have some sort of addressing thing. Addresses are very important, because without addresses, we don't know who's the intended recipient. Right? We have no idea. And if we can communicate these addresses, it means that we can relay information. We can build up knowledge about addresses, where they exist, or how to send things through other addresses. So they are knowledge, addresses are knowledge that also can be shared. But what's also important to realize is that messages, since we live in the real world, can be delayed, lost, or misunderstood. How many of you have ever experienced the misunderstanding of a message? I'll, I'll raise my hand, demonstration. That's a fundamental property of communication. So in order to reason a bit about reliability, there's this phrase that gets sort of thrown around about guaranteed delivery. So what does that even mean? So we typically have three different versions of guaranteed delivery. One is at most once. So if you send a message, it will be received at most once. It's typically the case if you send a letter to somebody, they won't get two versions of that letter, but they might not get it. At least once is we'll send the same message over and over, and you will just have to discard if you find that you've received it before. But it has a higher chance of reliability because if one gets lost, the other might get through. And exactly once is some sort of magical unicorn thing that doesn't really exist in the real world. Conceptually, 
we can build something that has very high reliability of receiving only one, but you can sort of make a blanket statement that says this has exactly one's delivery. So if we think about it, it's not about guarantees, it's about reliability. And reliability is about reasonability, right? If we can reason about the reliability of something, that we know that there's a chance that it might not happen, and as such, we need to do something about that. We can't do the happy path thing. So somebody might just say, well, just use two-faced commit, and it will just all work out. But as we all know, that doesn't really work in practice, because phase two is not the happy path. Communication is inherently bursty. If you look at it, you come here today, you'll get a lot of input, right, over a very short amount of time, but then you might go home and go to bed and there will be no communication for eight hours, perhaps. Some of this burstiness is predictable. You typically don't go to a conference unless you're aware of the fact that you will be receiving a lot of information, right? So you could predict that there will be a lot of information. But some of it is pretty unpredictable, right? You don't know when your kids are going to wake up in the middle of the night and scream, right? If we try to deal with the burstiness of communication and we can't cope with it, the option is to discard it, right? We don't listen to it. We'll just mark it as spam, right? But the problem is that if we do that, if that's our way of dealing with overload or a burst of messages that we can't deal with, what happens? Well, somebody might resend that information. Okay. So we might actually cause more information to come along because we just discarded information. So that means that having some sort of flow control over information, some back pressure, is quite important. We don't want to discard information and not let the sender know that it was discarded. And buffers, they typically only tend to work as grease between cogs, quote unquote cogs, right? Because buffers are not infinite either. So even if you buffer, at some point, you'll need to decide whether you're supposed to sh shed whatever information comes in. And load shedding, as I said, it doesn't inform the sender why this information was shed or when it's okay to send more information again. So there's a lot of context that is missing for the sender in this case. So for resilience, we can never assume that some other entity in this physical world is immortal, right? That doesn't work. Things come and go, machines come and go. And I think we need to tr treat sort of expectation violations as failures. Because if we don't know that something disappeared, then at some point we'll expect that something is wrong, or we'll, we'll think that something is wrong. And we need to treat that as a failure. This means that we always have to have a plan B. Like, we can't do happy path programming because there needs to be a plan B. Things can go wrong. And we can't really make the clients responsible for fixing a faulty provider. Um, I typically have, have an example of if you go to a vending machine and you put a coin in and you choose to get some chocolate bar or something and the machine is broken, should the machine tell the person who's trying to buy that error code 43 uh, out of memory error? What, what does that even mean? Am I, as the consumer of this thing, responsible for fixing it? And what does that even mean? So we can't really escalate the problems to the consumer. We have to escalate the problems to someone else. In this case, we might want to escalate to the service technician of the vending machine company saying that this device is broken and perhaps give the customer their change back and with a message saying that, please go find another vending machine because this is currently broken. So we need to sort of fail fast, but we also need to fail predictably so that we can reason about what happens when things fail. 
Supervision, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Erlang. Erlang, Erlang, anybody? Cool, all right. So supervision is a, is a very old concept, which essentially means that the responsibility of dealing with failure is a supervisor of that thing. And supervisors can be hierarchical. So there's a supervisor for the supervisor, and as Yuvenal said, who watches the watchman, right? At some point, you need, just need to, if things go this wrong, we'll just abort because everything is broken. So, actor model, anybody actor model? Actor model, actor model, okay, a few of you, okay. So, I've been involved in, in, in building this tool called Akka for the past five years, and it's an implementation of the actor model. And you can sort of see the, the unit of computation in Akka, which is the name of the thing, an actor. So, it's a unit of computation, and they have this sort of reactive property where they have a current behavior, which they apply to messages that they receive. They have an address to which you can send messages to. That's their sort of, their address for their mailbox, where these messages end up. So they have a mailbox. And they have some local storage, so that they can remember things. And if they don't have any messages, to process, they're completely just memory resident. They don't take any CPU power at all. So they will be scheduled to execute once they have a message. And it has this sort of hierarchical thing where an actor has a parent actor so that there is a possible supervisor and an actor could have zero to n number of child actors that it will supervise. So it's a hierarchy. And I don't know about you guys, but whenever I see calm, this is where I th what I think about. So the actor so it can get messages, but it will only pro process one message at a time. So it becomes this thing, right? It's a processor that processes one message at a time. And since it has an address, it doesn't know who will send it messages. So it could be n number of things that sends it or n number of other actors that sends it messages. But it's a single consumer of these messages. And the current overhead is about 450 bytes. So that means that you can have millions per gigabyte of RAM. So with our clustering, you can have about two and a half thousand nodes. So it's sort of like two and a half thousand nodes times millions of actors per gigabyte means like a lot of actors. So it's not like thinking about threads and I can only have a thousand of them or any kind of sort of scarce resource. But you can really think about actors as a lot of actors. So the actor model or actors are really great for communication. So they send and receive messages. Really good. That's sort of the core thing. And since they have an address, it means that they don't have to live in process. They could live on a machine on the other end of the planet or some other planet, doesn't matter. And it also means that you can scale this thing out because communication is all about being able to sort of send messages to other things. So you can have multiple actors, you can have millions of actors. And they're good at resilience because they have this sort of built-in supervisor thing where an actor will actively deal with the failures of its children actor or child actors. So that's a good sort of resilience story. What they are not that good at is composition. Like how do we take these millions of actors and wire them together? It's a challenge. Compos um, I don't have to preach to you about functional composition, right? It's the, it's the conference why I should never have to do that, right? So if we have this thing that is amazing for composition, perhaps we could do something with this. Like, could, we, could we get them to work together in some way? So functional programming, to me, is great for composition. It's like, to me, it feels like the purpose of functional programming. But I think one of the main challenges that I see is how do you do communication resilience using functional programming? Hmm. We have this thing that is really good at 
communication and resilience that's challenged with doing composition, and we have something that is great for composition, but is challenged with doing communication and resilience. If we can make these things work together, then perhaps we have something here. So we're working on something that we call Project Gobma. It's a Sami word for three, which is the third incarnation of this, this actor model. And the purpose is to try to distill an actor to its essence. Seems fluffy, right? What's the essence of an actor? But really, it is the behavior, right? What does the actor do? And everything else besides the behavior is a message. So we have messages and behaviors. This means that there's nothing in between that we can sort of accidentally close over in some wrong way that we currently could have an issue with. So what we can do there is if we have behaviors as a first-hand construct and we can make them functional, we can make behaviors composable so that you can compose behaviors and now you have composition on the inside of an actor. And we're also working on a completely pure actor implementation. And we're working on a process algebra that is inspired by the, the joint calculus. It's in the works, it's not all there yet. But that is a story in order to make the inside world of actors functional. So just to give you a bit of code, I don't wanna be one of those guys that never show any code, right? So this is Scala and Basically, there's two diff different things here. There are uh, signals and messages. And signals are the life cycle management. And message processing is the other one. So signals can be uh, the actor was restarted or uh, some other actor that you were depending on has just terminated or other sort of um, infrastructure related things. And message is, here's a, you had a message. Here's the message, and here's the context for you. And what's interesting about this is that they return a behavior. So that's the behavior for the next message. So you have recursion. And I don't think I need to go into the actual details, but I just wanted you to show that this code here doesn't have an actor at all. It is some sort of protocol up there with a command, get and put. There is a got message that is a result of a get. And there's an, an initial behavior that is applying the empty map to this with map behavior. So we can formulate the behavior outside of running it as an actor. Are you okay with me skipping on here? Cool, we can get back to that later. So, I don't know about you. This is my bold assertion. You know, some will scream that I'm wrong if I am. What are the most common dev tasks? Am I wrong? No? Am I right? Just yell when sort of hitting close to home here, right? Are we getting there? Okay, call it a day, <laughs> we're done here, right? In my world, these are some of the most common things that developers do. Some inputs, some transformation, some output, have some coffee, call it a day, right? So how can we improve that? So let's sort of undefine what we know about streams so far and just redefine streams for the purpose of this presentation. So a stream is an ephemeral, means that it just exists when you want it or as it runs. It's time dependent. It's a sequence of elements, so discrete. Possibly, but not necessarily unbounded in length or in the number of elements and in essence, it is the transformation and transportation of data. 
comes from somewhere, goes to somewhere. So we've been working on something called Aka Streams, which is our way of trying to deal with this problem. How do we compose using functional programming, and how do we leverage the actor model for its communication and resilience? So the lead world, the theme for this, was to get something that is immutable, reusable, composable, coordinated, asynchronous, and represents some sort of transformation. A lot of words. But the purpose is to build something that is able to leverage having multi-core without having to get your hands dirty. So one of the core problems is how do you get data across an asynchronous boundary? Right? How do I send information between something that runs here or at a different um, clock than something that is running over there? And you can think of it as sort of, how do I drink from a fire hose without this, right? There's, there's, a, there's a method that I, I, I've, I've sort of dubbed the, uh, the raccoon method. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that it's uh, an efficient means of dealing with getting more information or more data than you were expecting, but the raccoon method is interesting, to say the least. And whenever somebody tells me that they have a model that, processing, that processes streams of data without back pressure, this is, this is what I think I look like. So how do we get data across an asynchronous boundary with non-blocking back pressure? How do we make sure that we don't consume more data than we can deal with? So we had this sort of initiative where this, this, ha this has to be a problem where it's, it's not one of these sort of huge unsolved problems, but how can we just solve this problem in a nice, elegant way? So we created this sort of expert group uh, and tried to nail down a specification for dealing with this problem. So the end result, if we compare sort of push versus pull, the old models, we want to be able to support potentially unbounded sequences. Right, so we want to have something that is potentially large that we can transport somewhere else. And with a push model, that's fine, right? You just push. Super simple. Push, push, push. Pull model, also simple, right? There's no built-in limit to how much you can pull. But we also want to be able to get the sender running separately from the receiver. We don't want to lock them together. That works. You just push, right, push, still works. Still works with pull as well. So how can we vary the rate of reception from the rate of sending? Can we support that? Sure, you just send. If I can't receive it, I'll just drop it, right? I run at a different rate than you. I just drop your stuff. Same here, you can pull information, the sender can pull. if the. If the sender is faster, that doesn't matter because you didn't pull any information. But how about we don't want to drop stuff? Or we don't necessarily want to drop stuff. That doesn't work well, right? We push stuff, the, rece the receiver is not ready to receive it, then we'll have to drop it. Doesn't work. With pull, it works though. the receiver can just choose to pull whenever it's ready for information. So that's fine. So how about we get something that is minimal in terms of latency and throughput? How can we, how can we get something that is super fast? Well, push it super fast. There's just the overhead of sending in one direction. That's approximately as fast as you can get. But the pull problem is you first need to pull, and then the information needs to be sent. Right, so there's bi-directional communication happening for everything that you pull. That's not super, super fast. So how about we treat this thing as a supply and demand thing? Because that's what it's really about. So 
the sender we call a publisher here, and the subscriber is the receiver. So data flows from the publisher to the subscriber, but the demand for that information comes from the subscriber going to the publisher. Interesting. That means that whenever the subscriber is faster or can receive more things than the publisher can send, it becomes virtually a push model because the publisher can always push. But if, if, the, if the publisher is faster, it means that the subscriber will only send the demand that it can deal with. So it effectively becomes a pull model. Does that make sense? What's super interesting is that since this happens at runtime, if there's a change in rates between the publisher and subscriber, they will automatically switch between these sort of modes or behaviors. So it's an adaptive thing. Demand can be propagated whenever the subscriber wants to. So if the subscriber says that he wants five ice creams and then two seconds later says that he wants an additional five, that's fine. You can batch this demand saying that I want 100 ice creams, so you amortize the cost of transporting the demand. Because if you build in the implementation such that you request one, you get one, you request one, it becomes effectively a pull model. But you can amortize the cost of the pull by requesting more. So we call this sort of property dynamic push-pull. There, there was no good word for it, so we just invented one. So if we compare these things, if we only have push or only have pull, we have these problems, but we don't have the problem because we're sending back demand. So we don't have to drop stuff because the sender knows that there's no information needed from the, from the sender. And we can amortize the cost of pulling by saying that we want 100 or 1,000. An interesting observation is when you try to use this model with having multiple ins or multiple outs, splitting data downstream means merging the demand from the downstream. And the inverse is true as well. So if you're merging streams, you're essentially splitting demand from the downstream, saying that I want one from you and one from you. So what does this look like? So in ACA streams, we have something called sources, which is sources of, of elements or information. We have something called flows, which has one input and one output. We have sinks, where information goes. And if you plug these things together, we call it a runnable graph, because that is something that you can execute or make it run. And just to give you a sense of what it looks like, sorry. Let's say that we define fives to be a source that repeats the number five, unboundedly. We have times two, which is a flow of ints that just maps the input and does times two. We have another flow called int to string, which takes an int and calls the to string method on it. We can take these two flows that we have now and create a new flow by applying the via combinator. So we attach those two flows, but that returns a new flow. So the original ones are unchanged. We create a sync where we want to print this thing out. And we can then use fives, the source, via this transformation. But we want to augment that transformation with a take 10, because we only want five or 10 of these fives. And we then pipe that to sysout. So that creates a runnable graph. It's immutable. You can pass it around. You can call run on it as many times as you want. So it's a composed, like, like a blueprint of a transformation. And we have a step called materialization that happens when you call run. And that requires a materializer to be in scope. And essentially what that does is that it, it looks at the graph and instantiates a lot of actors for every stage and then pipes the information through and makes it execute. But what's interesting is that there's another combinator that I really like called bidirectional flows. 
So they have two ins and two outs, and they are cross-connected. So have you ever tried to design a, a protocol pipeline in, in a typical programming language before? Protocol pipeline. It's, it's terrible. But what we can do is, if we have a codec that is a bidirectional flow from foos to byte strings, and we have from byte strings to foos, and we have a crypto that takes byte strings and encrypts them to other byte strings, and then takes encrypted byte strings and turns them into unencrypted byte strings. And then we have some framing protocol that adds framing information to byte strings. Then we can create a protocol stack by just stacking them on top of each other. This is fully reusable, right? There, there's nothing that connects this to some networking thing or some file thing or some other input. We've just taken a description of things to do and compose them into something new. So typical sort of stream processing thing tends to focus on directed acyclic graphs. So we have this DAG here. The green stuff is, is sources. We have reddish orange terracotta or something uh, that is flows or some sort of fan in or fan out. And then we have the darker blue ones, which are sinks. So this is a DAG, and we support DAGs, of course. But we also support cyclic graphs. So this is opt-in because it's not recommended for a lot of things, but sometimes you actually need to have a feedback loop. And I've seen this so many times. I don't know if there's a name, I call it the watt graph, where you take a sink and a source and then you silently pipe the feedback around it. It's still a DAG, right? No, it's not still a DAG, it's a watt graph. So having direct support for cyclic graphs makes your program honest. How are we on time? Good. So fan in and fan out. I mean, that's the interesting stuff. That's how you are able to join streams or split streams and send things to multiple directions. And we support that as well. And we also support some fantastic stuff. Uh, one thing that we haven't implemented yet, but we're really looking forward to implement is a end-to-end -end way merge split operation so that you can program it yourself. We have Flexi Merge and Flexi Route for doing fan ins and fan outs programmatically. But uh, I don't know, I, I've called it sort of the, the, the Cthulhu merge route thing. And I can't really explain it in words, so I'll explain it with a video. Are you ready? That is how it works. Uh, looks complex, but it's really simple. One thing that I said earlier about sort of what does programmers do is inputs and outputs, right? Receive information, produce information. I like to think about if you turn things around and make them demand driven, it's not IO, it's OI. Right? Because the demand travels in the opposite direction of the data. That doesn't make sense at all, right? Everybody's fried. If demand travels upstream, it means that you could decide that if I can't write, then I shall not read. You have end-to-end -end back pressure. You could even say that if the user that requested this web page is not willing to read the bytes of the web page, then why should I even why should I even create the web page? Right? So out of the box, we try to support the normal stuff like file I.O. and TCP and HTTP and stuff like that, but it's completely extensible. And what's interesting is once you get this transitive back pressure. There are all kinds of things that you didn't think you'd need, but you now get for free. Like if you are an intermediary and you want to upload files to S3 or something else, and that is slow, then that back pressure is actually going through both you and back to the thing that is sending the information. 
So there is a boundedness of your I.O. that you wouldn't have otherwise. So I touched on the topic briefly earlier. I think this is one of the most interesting parts of it. Uh, the materialization, the ability to stage something, to create a description of transformation, and then by choice deciding how do I want to make that run. That is extremely powerful. So because if we can separate these things, then we can decide how we want to do it. We could have different materializers. We could do our own, right? We could, we could aug augment materializers. We could do some verification or, or validation on the graph. We could do optimizations, traverse the graph and see, okay, we can drop these steps here because they're no longer relevant. Or we could take this description of transformation and what if we take parts of it and run it locally and parts of it and run it somewhere else? That doesn't matter, right? It's a decision how to execute the blueprint. Another thing that I find interesting is what if we could get some result out of the materialization step? So we run the graph and we materialize it, but it's going to run asynchronously, concurrently, and possibly even distributed. What if I need some things out of the materialization step? This specific materialization instance. Well, every single stage has a materialized value that it can provide when it's going to be materialized. And as you compose these stages, you're provided with the option of sub uh, submitting a function that will compose the value of the previous stage with the value of the next stage to produce the materialized value of the composed thing. So you can actually, if you wanted to, you could even uh, compose like, a, like an age list of all the values throughout the stage and you will be given that when you materialize the view or the, or the stream. Right. So we're pretty good on time. So imagine that we have this runnable graph. So it has source A, it has a B, a fan out stage that fans to a fan in stage and a flow, right, C and D. And, well, you can read this, right? So it's, it's nothing specific but the feedback loop here, right? So there's, as things fall out in the end, they're fed back into the process. So it's like, it could be like a self-improving algorithm, right? Or a fraud detection filter thing, or imagine what. So let's see, what does that look like in code? So we create this closed, graph, right? It's a closed graph. It doesn't, will not have inputs and outputs exposed after it's created. We create A, which is a source of single, like it's a zero in this case. We create a broadcast, which will send the same element to multiple outputs. We have a merge that takes two inputs and merges those. We have a flow that adds plus one to things that get passed through. We have a balance, balance stage that will round robin balance amongst its outputs. And we have another merge stage of two. And then we have the sync that will just print out the value. And as you see here, we imported flow graph implicits, which will give us this sort of builder DSL with the squigglies that you can see over there. But if you look, the code representation of this graph is almost exactly like the graphical representation of the graphs, right? If you look at the graph picture next to it. So having these DAGs or even cyclic graphs, like in this case, and being able to reason about their layout is extremely important both for maintainability, but also to sort of find issues with how you formulated a graph. So you could, uh, if you wanted to, without importing the, the flow graph implicit, you could just add edges and, and, and manipulating the, uh, manipulate the graph programmatically. But this is more of a declarative way of, of uh, composing the graph. So if we have functional programming, 
right? We have functions and we can compose functions and we can do interesting things. And we can use them with Aga streams here and compose things. So the functional interface or the functional programming interface is towards the user. So this stack means that it's toward the user. And then we have Aka type or Project Goldma, which has functional programming on the inside of an actor. Then technically, we should be able to have functional programming on the outside, functional programming on the inside, and the fabric, the communication and the resilience will just be the middle layer of this sort of sandwich, right? So that is not exposed in this part, but we get the functional composition and we get the communication and resilience from using the materialization step. But we also have the benefit of using functional programming to implement that thing. So I think, to just to summarize, I think if we can use both these things, then we can get both the compositional strength of functional programming paired with the sort of communicational strength and resilience of the actor model. Thank you. We have five minutes for questions, I guess. Yes. So you want to, do you want to sort of introspect uh, what's currently or already added to the builder? Uh, that's really a good question. I haven't done that before. But since the builder just adds vertices and edges, the information is there. So I don't know if we have exposed it yet, but you could definitely do that. The, I think the question, it becomes sort of like a reflective thing, right? So how do you, do you even want to be able to reconstruct sort of or backtrack how you added stuff or not, or like pull it apart, or how do you want to deal with it? So you have both sort of the programmatic API of adding things manually, but you also have the, the DSL. But clearly, if you can, if you can devise another API for, for adding, uh, adding transformations, then you have all the tools at your disposal for doing so. Um, that's a good question. Yes. Yes. Oh, great question. So um, the Reactive Streams initiative is reactive-streams.org uh, and .com too. Um, you can get most of the information there. Uh, what we try to do with this. My experience with standards committees uh, has not been the best. I don't know if there are others that have the same experience, but what I think we did right here in this case was we got people like engineers together that shared the same problem and were willing to solve the problem and were willing to set aside uh, ideolo ideology sort of differences to get a, a thing that worked. And we spent quite a lot of time in compromise or compressing the, uh, the spec. So it's quite small. And we also sort of devised a TCK in order to verify implementations. Um, I hoped and wished that there would be better tools for doing this. So this is sort of like a urge to, to all of you, like if we can improve the way that we build specifications and verify specifications, then we'll do the world a lot of favors. Um, most of the protocol scars in my life is due to uh, different interpretations of the same specification, leading to a lot of uh, pain. But you'll, you'll get the more information around the back pressure model uh, from that. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in this case, we actually experimented with using an immutable graph builder. Uh, the thing is, both from a performance point of view, it creates quite a bit of, if, especially if you're defining a bigger graph, then it creates a lot of churn, like practically creates a lot of churn uh, for allocating the new stuff all, all over the place. Uh, so this is a case where we, we decided that having a very scoped set, sort of section of mutable code that doesn't leak out is very, sort of the pragmatic approach to the, to the problem. Um, I would love to see if we can improve that because uh, there are, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? So you, you're paying for that performance with other problems. But definitely, if you have ideas on how we could solve that better, more than all ears. Yeah. Reinventing laziness? Yeah, we put this background That's an interesting way of looking at it because it, it, it's sort of like it's not lazy, more like it's uh, demand driven slash uh, evaluate on. By, by need, uh, yeah. Uh, so Scala is a strict language, so that's the, sort of <laughs> one of the reasons. Well, it's a, you have to sort of work with what you have, but it's also due to um, dealing with potential network artifacts as well, you would have to, the implement, it's an implementation level problem. So the, the protocol itself does not really uh, mandate whether the language is strict or not. Yes? So, uh, so, so the implementation in this sense, uh, I mean the reactive streams implementation of the protocol. So the protocol only governs the, the sort of the, the valid transitions or the valid communication between the things. It doesn't really say how they should be implemented underneath, right? So if you want to implement it in a lazy language over here, in a strict language over here, it, it's, that's not a problem. Does that make sense? So, so, so the thing is, in a distributed system, you could get things failing, right? So the question is, what is the, the result, right? And is that, is that valid for all runs of the program? And I guess with a distributed system, you never know. But there is, a, there is a, both a specification for the valid um, the valid, how to say, the, the valid outcomes rather than the valid outcome. Yes. Cool. So it's the end of the day, and you're probably completely ready for uh, some fresh air and uh, a bit of a walk. So thank you, everybody.